Good afternoon and welcome to our li library lecture series. This series started many years ago and is sponsored by the Educational Endowment Fund. Today we had a rededication of the library and bookstore to acknowledge and thank the original library founders and the new library committee members for continuing the mission of scholarship, cultural education, and spiritual renewal in our community. Our speaker today is the theologian and author V.K. McCarty. She lectures at the General Theological Seminary and preaches at St. Gregory's Orthodox Mission, both in New York City. Her sermons can be found in the publication Public Orthodoxy. At the General Theological Seminary, she earned an MA cum laude in Biblical Studies and served for many years as acquisitions librarian. We are very fortunate that V.K. McCarty is with us today and are excited to hear about her new book, From Their Lips, Voices of Early Christian Women. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back of the room? Can you hear me on the video? <clears throat> what a pleasure it is for me to be here with you as we are rededicating the Heritage Library. <clears throat> I worked at the Louisville Free Public Library to put myself through my MFA in the early 70s after many years in theater in New York and then in publishing. What a joy it was to find that the window was opening again for me to come serve as the acquisitions librarian for the General Theological Seminary. I hadn't managed to make Broadway in my shows like my late husband did so successfully, but that library job started a whole new chapter in my life, transforming my love of theater into the opportunity to research bibliography and offer lectures in theology, especially about early Christian women. <clears throat> Here I am pushing 75 with only my first book out, but I feel so lucky and so grateful to God. I tell you, the female voice of Orthodox Christianity is all around us, familiar in prayer, from the holy, from the close harmony of chanted liturgy and surrounding the faithful in the cloud of treble voices among the church's saints. Even in our Sunday liturgy soon, the voice of Mary of Egypt cries out to us in the weeks to come, teaching us to turn for mercy and guidance to our gracious mother, the Holy Theotokos. Lead me now, we hear her voice say. She's praying before the icon of the Mother of God outside the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, as she's about to enter the wilderness following the desert fathers. Lead me now, wherever thou dost command. Be for me now a teacher of salvation. Lead me by the hand along the way of repentance. It's such an exciting time to be listening for women's voices in scripture and in early Christianity. So it's a real privilege to be able to show you my new book, From Their Lips, Voices of Early Christian Women. It provides highlights from the history of remarkable early Christians by exploring the lives of a dozen female leaders, many of them venerated as saints in the church calendar, <coughs> people whose courage and mission exemplify the role of women in the life of the developing church. Each one provides something of a textual icon crafted from the wisdom of the church fathers. It worked. <laughs> kind father, kind father. <laughs> Even if you offer me a cup of water. <laughs> One of the amazing things for me, studying the Bible in theological education, was the discovery that Paul, St. Paul the Apostle, 
was really not as bad to women as I thought. I came to seminary with a real chip on my shoulder about Paul and his attitude toward women. Maybe many people do. Oh, dear God. <clears throat> and I've got to tell you, it's part of why I started writing this book. I thought Paul really diminished the value of women and tried to invalidate them. So it was a complete revelation, just a breath of fresh air to discover in actually studying the Bible text, praying each one alive. You can clearly see that Paul respected women as friends and acknowledged them as co-workers. And best of all, he actually validated their ministry by working with them collaboratively. He calls out his appreciation for them, naming women over and over again in his thank yous and in his recommendations. Prisca, <clears throat> his tent making fellow worker in Jesus Christ, his sunergos, he calls her, and Unia, who was in prison with him, among the apostles, he says, and the deacon Phoebe from the church over in Cancrae. She's called prostatist, like your own proistemenos and diakonos in the masculine. Mind you, this was before the order of deacons was fully developed, but it's still pretty exciting. They all witness to women's leadership in the earliest faith communities. It's pretty remarkable. In fact, it's such a striking affirmation right there in scripture that now, over the centuries, there have unfortunately tended to be Bible translations that diminished the words describing early Christian women. But we here have scripture in the Greek, so we can be vigilant about that kind of invalidation. And this new book, From Their Lips, opens in the New Testament in Philippi. Huh. I don't understand this, it's wonderful. <clears throat> Down by the riverside. And it highlights early Christian women stretching over the whole next millennium of Christianity. So Paul goes to meet the Jewish people in Philippi where they pray together out by the riverbank. And on this particular day, it's the women who are gathered there praying. And he speaks with Lydia and Lydia speaks back. Why Lydia? Well, for one thing, I bet she looked different than Paul, someone exotic who had emigrated from someplace else. Is this Lydia? Could be. So this colorful character was different from the women he knew from his hometown synagogue. When he met Prisca, they were both tent makers, but Lydia was different. She was in the purple fabric business. She was a porphyropolis. And she had the wherewithal to invite Paul and his whole team to stay at her residential estate. And I wonder, I just love to ponder whether she was leading the prayers. Is that why Luke remembers her in the scripture? When Paul is reported sitting down with them, did he share prayer? led by Lydia before speaking with her about the gospel and baptizing her. Her voice is remembered in the Bible and she is quoted in the text, a rare and valuable marker of being remembered in scripture, especially for a woman. Sometimes it is very few words which remain for us to explore, but all the more reason to be vigilant in remembering their voices. And with her offer of hospitality, welcoming Paul into her home, Lydia is very likely the seed of an early Christian house church in Philippi. And we know that. We get the confirmation of that growth because later in the chapter, when Paul returns to the safety and comfort of Lydia's home, he is mentioned blessing the brethren 
the multiple brethren to Sadelfus who have begun to gather there. And these house churches were the creative hub of God's redemptive work. They were banqueting communities, celebrating the abundance of God in Christ, which is continually opening doors to repentance. That's the theologian John Koenig. <clears throat> and this is all part of the great excitement of the very early years after the life and ministry and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was spreading like wildfire. The compelling experience of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, lighting up hearts with hope and courage and gospel mission. And the first century saint, Tekla, she also was galvanized by that same spirit as well. We know her from the second century apocryphal acts. These are sacred texts that were circulating alongside the New Testament when the canon of scripture was still being negotiated. The acts of Paul and Tekla is a thrilling witness to faith and joy in Christ and a real pleasure to share with you in my new book. But so is this very early Christian artwork. And in fact, I met Tekla in this stunning Egyptian relief sculpture from the fifth century. They've got it in the museum at Kansas City. It's hard to look away from it. And there she is, a likely companion to the Apostle Paul. And she stands before us praying but she's also stripped and bound and provocatively exposed to public view in the gladiator arena in Antioch. This limestone sculpture is probably from near Axirrhynchus, you know, that village famous for early manuscripts. And this early Christian work captures in high relief the moment when divine intervention is about to transform a scene of intense violence with a promise of salvation in dangerous times for early believers. Tekla's divine vision of the Lord as she was being condemned has been seen as equivalent to the Lord appearing to Saint Stephen right before he was stoned at the end of Acts 7. And as a result, both Stephen and Tekla are characterized as proto-martyrs by the church on their feast days. Saint Tekla's deliverance from martyrdom and her preaching ministry after that captured the imagination of countless Christians in the early centuries of the Jesus movement. Here's her shrine and healing center where Gregory of Nyssa was said to have gone when he was dealing with family grief and Egeria reports coming here on pilgrimage. Even if Tekla's story was deemed to be extra canonical outside the canon of the Bible, it may nevertheless reflect remarkably accurately what it was like for many second century women who ventured away from the family hearth to follow the gospel of Jesus Christ and found themselves like Tekla in violent confrontation with Roman society. Thank you, Father. The, no, no. The Acts of Paul and Tekla is a tale of high adventure and divine miracles. And as you can hear, this ancient document presents a vibrant tension living between the ascetic and the erotic components of the story. In her own day, in the generations right after she died, when people were gathering at her shrine, the example of Tekla's luminous faith was used as an endorsement in support of women's active ministry in the early church, including, thank you so much, preaching and baptizing. And we know it was actually going on because of the church father, Tertullian, boldly blacklist Tekla in one of his treatises we still have. And yet, origin 
cites Tekla approvingly, and Bishop Athanasius praise, praises Tekla, and Methodius, and Gregory Naziensis regards her as an apostle martyr. So it just fills me with wonder and joy to realize, even in the earliest centuries, that the Holy Spirit was indwelling and inspiring men and women alike. And we know this from both the Old and the New Testaments, from the prophecy of Joel, saying clearly <clears throat> that both the men and the women will be inspired to prophesy and preach. And at Pentecost, in the Acts of the Apostles, when the men and the women were followed, Jesus, including the Holy Theotokos, were all gathered in prayer in the upper room in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit poured down like a gust of wind on all present, and by virtue of them, on all believers of Jesus Christ after that, and on you. And we know what many of the men did with that profound inspiration. Church history is filled with their stories. But what about the, Father, what about the women? How did their evangelization help spread the faith? For the most part, it was a radically patristic time. And what women achieved day by day was often not thought worthy to be recorded. And if it was, it could likely be diminished in editing or deleted altogether. But we're looking for the women more now. And they are there in the Bible and several times quoted in the documents of the Greek church fathers. And now we know that if the memory of a woman's theological teaching or ministry has persisted and we get a glimpse of her in an ancient text, we are very likely looking at the tip of the iceberg about what it means what it actually represents about the women who were there making a contribution. So the very fact then that women, that is half the faithful, are just plain missing from so many historical narratives, even from scripture, does bear noting. So I've been searching in the Greek fathers and the Latin fathers for the last 20 years, ever since starting to work as a seminary librarian, for little details that will bring the men and the women alive, embody them, if you will. Each of the stories in this book provides you with a window into the real lives of early Christians. And I discovered a fascinating network of women spiritual leaders who are part of our early church heritage. And I really want you to have a sense in my writing that they were actually there singing and praying and feasting with Christ and experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it's a real it was a real pleasure for me to discover Saint Syncletica. Even among other early Christian women present in the Patrologiae Greca, Mother Syncletica stands as an extraordinary figure, for her sayings have survived in two volumes. 81 of her teachings are gathered in the Vita in PG 28, and a smaller selection are in the volume called The Sayings of the Desert Fathers, the Apophthegmata Patrum in PG 65, where she joins two other female elders from the desert tradition, Mother Theodora and Mother Sarah. This trio of desert mothers are certainly amas among the abbas. Ami Syncletica taught her disciples to strive toward spiritual union with God's love by means of humble ascesis and practical study, practices. And here you get to see the full icon of Syncletica from the book cover. It's done by Eileen McGuckin, uh, Matushka, to uh, Archpriest Professor John McGuckin. He retired and went back to England, but the icons are so beautiful. 
Here you can see it with the name and the scroll and all. I cut her down so she would just look like every saint on the cover. The humility of Christ, Sinclenica said, is difficult treasure to acquire, yet necessary to be saved. It is the one virtue the devil cannot mimic. So even as it strips you down, it clothes you in salvation. No wonder followers remembered her sayings. She taught, choose the meekness of Moses and you will find the stony places in your heart transformed into springs of water. Sincletica is known to have been a wise counselor of the soul and many of her sayings have survived. In fact, she stands beside Saint Anthony the Great in monastic memory. He is hailed as the father of monks and Syncletica can rightly be named as the mother of ascetics and the one to say it was uh, Matushka's husband, John McGuckin, in one of his history books. She is the mother of ascetics. She is the first female founder in the early development of monasticism. <clears throat> you know, in the same way as the remembered sayings of Jesus, raw, abrupt, piercing in essential wisdom, many of the sayings, the apophigmata of Syncletica, undoubtedly trace back to some individual disciple's memory of a stellar experience, receiving a very personal answer from her. Here's one of her most celebrated. It's about divine fire. There is struggling and great toil at first for all those advancing toward God, but afterward, ineffable joy Indeed, just as those seeking to light a fire at first are engulfed in smoke and teary-eyed, thus they obtain what they desire. As it is said, our God is a consuming fire, so we ought to kindle the divine fire in ourselves with tears and toil. St. Sincletica offers her disciples down through the ages wisdom and help in striving toward nearness to God. So her teaching has been described as a rare mystical pearl, a margarita, veiled in iridescent layers of spiritual meaning. Now, while some female spiritual elders, like Ami Sincletica, are remembered venturing into the desert, in order to pursue a life devoted to Christ, some women, such as the Cappadocian abbess, Macrina the Younger, were able to spearhead faith communities within their residential environment. And as a result, they too became foundational leaders of early Christian monasticism. Ah, uh, just think of poor Gregory of Nyssa and his appalling experience, being called to his sister's deathbed is so soon after his brother Basil the Great had also died. So with a heavy heart, he reports on his last visit with her, writing in intimate quoted dialogue his memories of her teaching. Bishop Gregory's examination of Macrina's lifelong spiritual transformation shows how she led the whole family toward the divine life devoted to prayer, and it illuminates both on the soul in resurrection and his vita of his elder sister. In fact, if you listen, the remembered voice of her theological teachings is present throughout much of his writing. She says, the divine life will always be activated through love 
and knows no limit to the activity of love. She remained the role model for him for the rest of his life. Now, for many of us, one of the abiding and pleasurable memories of experiencing Orthodox liturgy is the distinctive ancient musical harmony of female voices chanting the prayers, repeating the praise due to the glory of God Almighty again and again so that it seems to resonate throughout the whole body of the faithful in church. So especially for the choir directors among you today, I find it so pleasurable and satisfying to reflect on those women who appear to have been appointed by the Patriarch of Jerusalem in the early centuries to chant the Liturgy of the Hours on Holy Saturday morning while preparing the lamps inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They were liturgically embodying the historical mermbearers, weren't they, who came back to the tomb of Jesus early on the third day and first experienced the resurrection. When the service was over, the patriarch locked the great doors until the Paschal Vizier, but later the Tipicon mentions that the myrrh bearers remained behind and re-entered the Holy Sepulchre in order to sense and anoint it. And when the patriarch entered the church on Easter morning, the myrrh bearers were standing before the Holy Sepulchre, and at the rejoice, Christ is risen, they prostrated and rising up, they sensed the patriarch, chanting the Polychronion, the many years hymn. These myrrh bearing altar servers appear to have served the Byzantine church from the fifth to the ninth century, and that chanted prayer was part of the Holy Week observances. And women are remembered for not only chanting, but also for composing the hymns. Even a few of the hymns we sing today in the liturgy. Letters from the Church Father, Theodore the Studite, help us authenticate the ninth century hymnographer, Cassia. Her life is described in no less than four different volumes of the Patrologiae Greche. The best known of her many published compositions is the beloved Lord, the woman fallen into many sins. It's chanted as part of Holy Wednesday Vespers, which is sung on Tuesday night. For many Orthodox, the Cassiani, as the hymn is often called, is one of the highlights of Holy Week because of its appealing melody and also the opportunity it affords for the priest to elaborate on the tune with flourishes of extemporaneous melismatic ornaments which can leave worshippers spellbound. And uh, emotional urgency does simmer through Cassia's hymn in light of the approaching passion of our Lord. The survival and popularity of Cassia's hymns is certainly due to deep association with her spiritual father, Theodore the Studite, and his monks in Constantinople. And it was during the time when they were working to organize and unify the Orthodox liturgy by including her work in the month monthly Meneon and the Lenten Triodion we're using now, Abbas Cassia's works have been authorized for worship in regularly scheduled Orthodox services to this day. Here is an ensemble of Bulgarian nuns, and they call themselves the Cassia Singers. <laughs> they have a great CD out. And now today, wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Christ, one of them is probably a woman, where two or three Orthodox gather, two of them are likely to be women. And so this book is meant to encourage visibility of some of the prominent women in the early history of Christianity who contributed to the sacred heritage of the church, which we enjoy today. 
There's a Byzantine deaconess <clears throat> who was seized by Christ's flame, as John Chrysostom puts it. That's the woman he calls his soulmate, Olympias. And there's even a Byzantine emperor's daughter with a knack for epic biography of her father, the emperor. My friends, these are just a few of the women who left their roots in the story of the church. And they are all the ancient forebears of our women theologians today and iconographers today for our women scholars and grand school administrators, for our church diplomats and certified chaplains and choir directors. Of course, my book isn't comprehensive. It's just meant to whet your appetite to a few of the early Christian contributors, remarkable women who led the early church communities from their lips to tell the whole story but it does help you connect some of the dots to better understand the contribution of women's voices to the great song of Christianity. Thank you so much. Does, uh, does anyone, would like to anyone have, offer any questions to uh, Professor McCartney? McCarty? I'm going to sit for the questions. <laughs> and there's a microphone over there if you want to use to uh, voice. Uh, if I sit here, are you okay? <laughs> but I won't say anything important. <laughs> I do have a, two questions, or kind of statements, questions a little bit. So one is um, one is uh, the life of. Uh, um, I don't want to hold. You want to clip this on? Yes, you do it. Okay. The the life of Queen Helen, ah. which I find intriguing because one is that. You know, from the way I understand the story, you know, she was given as hospitality to a general that came into the town where family was. Oh, the early story. And this is how she gets pregnant. And, and the um, robe, do you know the robe? Yeah, well, the pin or the... the Maybe a purple robe he left. Yeah, he left that was behind. how they found the woman again. Yeah. I love these stories. And then, uh, so no then, true cross. No true crosses in, there, in any of those stories. And, and, and it's uh, interesting here. She's raising her son as a um, uh -huh. as a single mother. Uh huh. And then she can't even marry the person because of the way marriage. Yes, he has to he has to marry up. And then. Um, and it works because he becomes emperor. Her son. Uh, no, the son's father had to put. Helena away yeah, yeah. And, and marry expeditiously in order to rise up, and he became one of the emperors. Okay. Then, then Const Constantine became, oh my God, look. So I, 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 I'm intrigued with her life. I don't know if, it's, if that's part of their, and then the other is. Oh yes, it's a whole chapter. Okay. But my premise is, what can we know about Helena without saying true cross, because I'm telling you, nobody was talking about the true cross in 399. They hadn't dug it up yet. Um, I think it has a lot to do with what the difference, I cut a couple things out, I was getting tired. Um, there was a place where I wanted to say, how can we tell when we're listening to this stuff in church? How can we tell the difference between biography of Helena and hey, geography, uh, way I, sometimes I just want to know the life. And I think we can say that the difference is that hey, geography has an intention of actually telling the biography of God. And in Helena's story, when we are telling the biography of God, we need to say that she discovered the true cross. Um, okay, I, it's hey, geography. Um, uh, 
But the chapter in my book is about what we can know, which is a lot, because of Eusebius. Uh, what can we know about her life and her faithfulness? Um, and her struggles. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, these, yeah. And, and the other one was uh, St. Fortini, the Samaritan woman. Uh, Who? Who? The Samaritan woman. Oh Saint my, I haven't done her yet. So, <laughs> along with... Along and she with, speaks. I'll do anybody who speaks. Yeah. Along with her and Thecla, it's interesting because I was looking up the, uh, I wasn't being um, disrespectful, I was looking up the uh, iography of Thecla. On the yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, they, they have the title in the church as Isa Apostoli, so equal to the... Equal, equal to, to the apostles, apostles, like Helena and Constantine. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure Stephen, whatever, I mean, they wouldn't do anything to her that they don't do to Stephen, like calling her proto matra. So Sinkliti ah, yes. was, I had, we had to read her in Greek at the seminary. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> you probably did better than I did. <laughs> no, no, no. I've taken all this Greek and it just goes out of my head every time. And I never move without a lexicon. But I love that she's a discreet opus. You got 81 teachings here. You got 20 here. And then that's it. So I am something of a Sincletica specialist. I write and write and write over and over and over again about Sincletica. Sir. I have a question. Uh, so, of course, uh, Mary is a very seminal person in the Christian faith. And uh, after the crucifixion, I was wondering if you could talk about Mary's role <clears throat> I think that the heritage of Mary and her ministry after the crucifixion is a very important part of the church. Um, I have tended to focus more when, for some reason, quotes are remembered and I have, there are some seminal figures that I um, have not, in fact, studied except to pray toward her. Um, and that, I mean, that's not knowing what she did after the crucifixion, but I pray toward her efficacy uh, when I am feeling like I'm pushing the train, like Connie, like I was this morning trying to get here. Um, so um, I'm, not, I'm unworthy of answering your question, except to say that she answers my prayers. And much of it is about the efficacy of her ministry after the crucifixion, even though I don't, I don't know what it was. I think the priests in the sacristy could tell you more of the traditions, but I'm not up on them. Do you want me to comment on that? Sure. <laughs> We'll talk in front of the hagiography. Of, of, yes, yes, yes. But uh, the, in, so uh, Professor McCarty mentioned something about, I think, was it with the life of Thecla? Where, where are the sources from? The apoc apocryphal? Right? The apocryphal acts, the acts of Paul and Thecla is the document. So you know that uh, most of the life of, this, of the Virgin Mother um, that we use in our feast days throughout the year, and there's many feast days, her birth, her entrance into the temple, the conceptions, the, um, her falling asleep, um, that there's really not much in the scriptures written per se, and so we take them from the, uh, the apocryphal gospel, the, yes. the Evangelio, the, the, the yes. gospel of Thomas, things that never made it into the canon. Absolutely, but they were alongside the New Testament in a way that they are not today. Yeah. And, we, <clears throat> and we call it Thelo Woman. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, <clears throat> kind of the, the traditions uh, from, without being a, 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 a professor in, in this area, a, a couple of things. One would be that we pretty much talk about her. She was the one that was keeping the apostles together. She was the one that was kind of the, the apostles gathered around her. Um, 
she spent, uh, there's a little bit of a different understanding from the Roman Catholic uh, tradition and, and the Orthodox tradition. The Orthodox have her going to Ephesus. Here, here. The Catholics have her go to Ephesus uh, because she was under the care of St. John the Theologian. Um, we, uh, our tradition is that she stayed mostly in Jerusalem and John didn't go to Ephesus until after her falling asleep. Um, we have a tradition of her going to Mount Athos, where when she stepped on the land of Mount Athos that was pagan at that time, it says all the idols fell. And that people thought that God stepped on the, the earth at that moment. And they came out to find out who she, what happened. You have to stand and, in the sacristy to get these stories. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and <clears throat> this way, Mount Athos is dedicated totally to the, to the Virgin Mother that no other woman is allowed to step foot on. This is, now again, Biography or <laughs> geography, but this is uh, uh, you know some of the things that, 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 that we have. So, but we're hearing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. This is the Holy Spirit through the Theotokos when we hear the tradition. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that she is, according to the Acts of the Apostles, in the upper room with the disciples <clears throat> when the fire. In the Scripture. Yeah. Yep, in the Acts of the Apostles. Yep, absolutely. We just don't have much after that. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, in, in the Greek Orthodox faith, uh, during the Holy Week, on Holy Tuesday night, we celebrate the liturgy of Cassianis. We do. And if you could kindly tell us the story of Cassianis, because every year I want to hear it again because I don't remember it <laughs> that well. So if you know the story, could you explain She's it? from the 9th century. Um, <clears throat> she, I guess if you, I, I didn't, I only wanted to do the religious stuff, but if you ask me, uh, the reason she's in four of the Patrologia Greci is before the religious stuff, she was called to the bride show of the emperor. And uh, hagiography, uh, she's reported making a, um, smart-ass remark that was to say the least. true. <laughs> I will never forget what you said to me the moment I met you. <laughs> um, but it was truer theology. The emperor looked down on this among the beautiful maidens and said, uh, well, you know, <laughs> women. Um, that it's all, it's all part of the sin of Eve. And she snapped back, not, she didn't stay silent, and she said, yes, but through the Theotokos came good, and in the Greek it just lilts right along. She did not get chosen. And that's, that's what's in the Patrologia Greci over and over and over and over again. But then, um, she had wanted to become a monastic. <clears throat> and when you are an aristocratic teenage daughter, you don't do any choosing like that. You follow your parents to an aristocratic marriage. But having said something theologically correct, but insulting to the emperor, uh, her parents paid for a convent and she was the abbess. So that's the start. And in their family, was a wise man who was visiting <clears throat> and was her spiritual father. And it was the church father, um, Theodore the Studite. And he was there. He had been another place first. But then he came as a reformer to the Studite monastery in Jerusalem. And he was called to a great, great vocation of unifying and organizing different ways that we do the liturgy in different countries. And this is a work that we respect to this day. But he also had um, little Cassia, who was his spiritual daughter, and she was composing hymns. So he and the monks tucked a few of them into the liturgy. And one of them is on Tuesday night, the Cassiani, and another one, my chapter, is about the one that you sing on Christmas Eve. Another one about the incarnation. Do you like the story? There's one little note I'd like to add to it. So when she was writing the hymn of Castiani, 
this is what, again, tradition, that the emperor came to visit the monastery. Oh, the last, fr oh, tell it, tell it, oh. <laughs> How could you leave that out? How could I leave that out, Father? <laughs> because I wasn't standing in the sacristy door. So uh, she was writing the hymn and the, um, and, and the, it, the report comes at the emperor and she didn't want to be in, in his sight. So she went and hid herself. Yes, she did. And he came across the writing of the hymn that she was writing, and it was about the, the, the footsteps in the... You tell. <laughs> I paused him for a reason, but... <laughs> <laughs> it was obvious. <laughs> that uh, as God, as uh, they heard uh, God's footsteps in Eden, so the emperor completed that little line in the, in the hymn. And that's, it was connected to the, to the hymn of St. Cassiani. Here, here. <laughs> I think the biography of God is present in that story. He, it's not a joke. Uh, hagiography is the living energy of God coming to us in these stories. Uh, if it's just facts, uh, it's just biography. Uh, hagiography is the living God coming to us. It's the tradition. Yes, uh, Father. Michael. Yes. Michael? Yes. Very good. Very nice to meet you, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I have three little daughters, and we have a... Oh, I was worshiping with them this morning. Oh, were you in the chapel? Yes, Father. Um, and they have a lovely book by Atama Publishing, The Princesses and Queens uh, Among Our Saints. Okay. And, um, and so they love reading all of the saints' lives. But it's very interesting, as you go through them, you see one nation after the next converted by this, you know, this female saint. Olga, yes. Saint Helen. Yes. Saint Olga. Oh, yes. Saint, I think, Bridget, uh, the one who, Clovis, so the whole Frank in the kingdom. Uh, saint Irene. Saint Irene. I mean, all of these, these women that uh, are astounding aristocrats who kind of, you know, influence the life of the church so profoundly. Except uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily emphasize them in the same manner. And there's a, there's a lot of talk of this and why it may be the case that, uh, you know, even in the Gospels, the Baniyya is so important, so vital to us, so important to even the life of the early church. But they didn't need it. You know, the story of St. Luke, he gave, when he gave Theophilus his Gospel, when he wrote the Gospel of Luke, there was an icon of the Baniyya with it. He gave the icon for the, the gospel and the icon. So the, there's comments on this being the ethos of Christianity and not necessarily the, the actual evangelium, the good news, but it's always carried in the heart of a woman. Interesting. That is best transferred. And I, don't know I think right. we are on a threshold of realization and acknowledgement. And I think the fathers uh, help us experience the threshold from the treasury of the tradition. And my ministry is to very slowly, step by step, use the old documents and remind you where the women are in the old documents. Even a book called The Sayings of the Fathers, that there are women in there. So I think uh, it, is a, it, a, it is a treasure of a time about learning uh, the value of the contribution of women. This is wonderful to hear. Uh, it gladdens my day. And it inspires my daughters. <laughs> Your daughters were... Inspirational today. They, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It was... Um, they are full of the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> any other any other questions or I need to sit down. <laughs> if we have the, the committee come up with uh, con Thank you. Oh goodness. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are so oh you are so kind. Thank you. And this is a oh, little icon also. Oh, an icon, very Actually, good. One on one side, one on the other, the TV. Oh. Mm-hmm.
and then one together. together. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.